Hello everyone, we hope you're all doing well. Welcome to the step up series discussion related to two important subjects of your GS1 paper that is art and culture and society. The purpose of this discussion is very simple. It's not just to enrich the quality of your content, but also to bring about certain changes in your thought process. And hopefully these changes that we emphasize on, if you're able to implement it well, you will be able to score a good amount of marks in the upcoming mains examination. Let us start our discussion first by taking up art and culture. Now, what is this first question? How did Bhakti and Sufi movement lay the foundation for reconfiguration of society and religion on more equitable lines? Explain. Now, Bhakti and Sufi movement in recent few years, UPSC has focused on it to a very large extent. Okay. What are the various ways in which they have asked question? They would have given Bhakti and Sufi movement and they would have asked how it impacted certain art forms. It could be architecture, it could be literature, it could be painting, so on and so forth. They might have taken one Bhakti or Sufi reformer and asked what were their contributions. It could be Basavanna, it could be Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, so on and so forth. The other thing is they would have given Bhakti and Sufi movement as a whole and they would have asked what was its impact on Indian society? What were the reasons behind it? They would have asked, they might ask you an analysis of Bhakti and Sufi movement vis a vis certain objective. This question, which is given, the first question is related to the last dimension, the impact of Bhakti and Sufi movement. Right? How did Bhakti and Sufi movement lay the foundation for reconfiguration of society and religion on more equitable lines? Explain. Usually, what happens? The moment Bhakti and Sufi movement is asked, People tend to write about what was the objective of Bhakti and Sufi movement. What was its objective? To emphasize on devotion rather than ritualism. To emphasize on selfless service rather than selfishness. Nothing wrong with that. That's absolutely one of the messages that Bhakti and Sufi reformers spoke about. But since everyone is doing that, even when you quote the same thing, there's no originality. You have to bring some sense of originality in that. So here, what alternative introduction you can give us? You can describe the state of the society during those times. Briefly, it was a society where there was social hierarchy in terms of religion, in terms of gender, in terms of caste. And the social frustration amongst the people, the anger among the people over the prevailing condition was quite high. It was in this scenario that Bhakti and Sufi movement rose in Indian society. Something like this. Or you can describe what Bhakti and Sufi movement meant to you. For me, when I'm reading Bhakti and Sufi movement, it denotes a form of silent revolution. All right. Silent revolution in the sense it wanted to bring about structural changes in Indian society dynamics and it went about in a way by emphasizing on universal love. Another alternative introductions. Please don't go for these introductions which are very common in nature. Everyone does that. Okay. And this is not something that I am telling you to adopt in each and every question where you have alternative introductions available. Go for that. Other than that, in the body of the answer, how you should go about, look at the question, how did Bhakti and Sufi movement lay the foundation for reconfiguration? Before you can answer that, you need to talk about the status of society during those times. How was the status? There was religious division, there was caste divisions, there was ritualism, the lower sections of the people were um, exploited. Okay, all these things, you can just briefly talk about it. Then, talk about how it set the foundation to make Indian society more equitable. How Bhakti and Sufi movement gave that foundation. From ritualism to devotion. The famous reformer Basavanna from the state of Karnataka said, all these rituals and customs that people blindly follow is meaningless. If you want to show devotion to God, show devotion to God through work. Don't worship God just in the form of idols. 
worship God as Atma Linga. Your soul itself is Linga and show utmost devotion. Keep your thoughts pure and innocent. When you are trying to do that, you are building a sense of empathy, compassion, brotherhood. Right? Here I have given a subheading. I quoted a Bhakti reformer and I told you what was its importance in terms of reconfiguration, reconfiguration of society. That is what is expected. If you are able to do this for five dimensions minimum, that is very much appreciated. Right. Moving on. Selfishness to service minded. Which Bhakti reformer can you think about? Almost all Bhakti reformers, Sufi reformers, they spoke about it. Don't start amassing wealth to a large extent. Involve yourself in charitable activities. Sikhism. All right, when you look at the practice of Sikhism, the practice of Langar, that is one example that you can quote about. Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, they all talk about charitable activities as well. From selfishness to service minded, serve the people, see the God in the work that you do for others. Right? That's one thing. Addressing socially regressive values. In those times, women had a subservient position in the society. Right? But when Bhakti and Sufi movement came, it gave a platform for women to talk about themselves, to realize God. Examples of that is Mirabai, Akama Devi from the south, the state of Karnataka. Right? All these points you can talk about. Basavanda spoke, Ramanuja Acharya spoke about how even the people from the lower caste should be allowed to read Vedas. Right? That is one more thing. Apart from that, emphasis on universal love. It could be translated in terms of tolerance. No matter the divisions that we have in the society in terms of religion, caste, gender and whatnot, all of us should be able to treat each other with mutual respect. Right? When you are emphasizing on that universal love, you are trying to realize that unity and diversity. Which reformer can I talk about? Kabir was one such reformer. There's so many examples like that. Okay. Apart from that, position of woman, I've already given you the example of Akam Hadevi Mirabai. Lower sections in the society. Kabir himself was from a lower section in the society. You have also come across Bhakti reformers who were from the weaver community, who were from the cobbler community. Right? That's one thing that you can talk about. Regional culture. Bhakti and Sufi movement, it gave emphasis on regional languages such as Marathi, Kannada. When I talk about Eknath, Namdev, Naneshwar, all of them were very important for the rise of Maratha nationalism on the back of which Chhatrapati Shiv, uh, Maharaj Shivaji came to power. Okay, Regional culture, not just in terms of literature, but also in terms of painting and architecture, all these are there. You can just give one example in terms of literature and then you can move on. So when you look at this question, how it led to reconfiguration of society and religion, both society and religion, we have emphasized. All right. Conclusion. Before you go to conclusion, you can say, however, the foundations were led. The realization of this was not adequately realized. All right. Then you can give a conclusion. Give an optimistic conclusion regarding the movement or its relevance in the present times. We are living in a time which is characterized by widespread intolerance, which is characterized by rising of hate speeches. When you follow the message of Bhakti and Sufi movement, which was love, care, compassion, universal brotherhood and everything like that, all of the problems that we are having now will automatically go away. The sustainable development goals of poverty can be eliminated quite successfully when we develop that sense of compassion in us. Is it not? That is what you need to write. So when you are looking at a question, understand the core demand of the question. And 
don't instinctively write what comes to your mind for that first one minute brainstorm what should be the structure of your answer how you can bring originality in some places you can't write an original answer in all hundred percent here and there if you can bring that originality that is always appreciated and make sure that you don't write a very verbose answer a subheading okay one statement related to that and an example just focus on the core message of that statement that's it all right moving on let's move on to the next question how was the diversity in indian culture reflected through its music explain how will you give an introduction for this people usually go for defining what is diversity or talking about music is so and so right the again the definition approach but if i were to write or attempt this question how would i go about it i'll talk uh, talk about when was the first time we have evidences of music from the times of bhim bedka paintings right in this bhim bedka painting there is a painting where a group of people are holding each other and it seems as if they're dancing and there can't be a dance without music okay i can also throw light about samaveda which has many musical notes in it i can talk about some of the literary resources Bharata Muni's Natya Shastra, which talks about music, or I can talk about the fundamental aspect of any art form. Music is an art form which tries to evoke emotions in you. The Navarasa that we talk about, okay? And why are we trying to evoke emotions in you? It might be to make you understand yourself better. or it might be to make you understand your religion better it's like that right whatever introduction that you want to give that is up to you but don't go for definition approach in every question try to bring in some originality wherever it is possible here they have given diversity and music how will i connect that in my introduction i told you from the times of bhim bedka we have had the traditions of music and india is a country which has been accommodative to various cultures we have had cultures coming from east asia we have had cultures from central asia west asia we have had uh, cultures coming from the european countries as well all those cultures have greatly enriched the art form of music so you can identify all these cultures and then you can just talk about how it has enriched and you will be elaborating on that in the body of the answer <clears throat> how do we find diversity or differences we have classical music classical music and folk music in classical music you have hindustani classical music and carnatic music and both these classical musics they have their own uniqueness the diversity or uh, in terms of ragas that we have had the diversity in terms of musical instruments that we have had. all right you can talk about it apart from that when i talk about hindustani classical music there are certain ragas which were added to it based on persian influence the qawalis ghazals right you can give these examples apart from that folk music well classical music have a proper traditional way of transmitting of knowledge folk music on the other hand is not like that it's something which is rooted in the common people's life baul is one such folk music from the state of west bengal lavani is a folk music from the state of maharashtra there are so many examples of folk music you can talk about that sometimes folk musics are rooted in the profession of the people sometimes it is rooted in the environment in which the people are living it, for example uh, northeastern region you have on bell festival sangai festival where they emphasize on the local folk music to a larger extent okay you can talk about that popular music this is also one more form of diversity that we have in our country right you are coming across songs in these uh, entertainment industry where you have the fusion of indian classical music happening with the hip hop or the western style of music as well that's one more diversity feature that we have in our musical traditions tribal music right the tribes of uh, that are living in our country have their own unique culture in terms of music also they have 
For example, the Jumur songs, which are sung usually by the Santalis. That's one more example. Religious music. When we talk about Sikhism, right, they narrate something called as Shabad Kirtans, right? How religion has added to the diversity of India's music. We have such examples in Hinduism as well, Islam, Christianity, okay? The Kavalis, the Ghazals that I spoke about earlier. Fine. Apart from that, musical instruments. You talk about Hindustani classical music, folk music or the Carnatic music. All of them have their own unique musical instruments which are used. Okay. So when we talk about music, it showcases wide spread diversity or differences. Right. So that is what you need to explain in this answer and you have done that. That is all that is required. Okay. How will you conclude for this particular question? Despite having varied differences, all right, India has been able to maintain that unity and diversity. People always quote the reasons for that being constitution and what not. Everything is fine. But our arts is also one such thing. I don't understand much of Bengali, but I do watch some of Bengali movies. I do like uh, some of the songs in Bengalis. Same is the case with Malayalam, right? Telugu, it goes on like this. Music is one such art form which unites us despite the differences that we might have in terms of our language. An optimistic conclusion. The next question is, illustrate with examples as to how the contributions of universities of ancient and medieval India were much more than just being premier religious come academic establishment. This is for a 15 marker. Now, these type of questions, they will ask at least one question from art and culture will be a bouncer question like this. Now, whenever we have read about universities such as Nalanda, Takshasila or Vikramshila or from the south you have uh, the Nagarjuna, Vallabhi universities. We have just read them from a prelims perspective. Alright? We have not focused on the means angle of it. Here, even though you have read from a prelims perspective, you will have some general set of points which will fetch you marks. All right, how to think in those scenarios, we will discuss later. Coming to the first thing, introduction. How should your introduction be for these questions? Any country, if it has a good sense of governance, it, if it needs to have a good, effective and efficient governance, education system is very important. Many a times the Britishers tend to portray that ancient and medieval form of education that we had in our country was backward, was regressive. That's not the case. What is the justification I have for that huge number of universities we had in ancient as well as medieval times? So you can use this. Education was an integral part of the governance framework of empires both in ancient and medieval India. Kama, this is reflected in many institutions which were established across all the country. You draw a map, and represent Nalanda, Takshasila, Vikramsila, Vallabhi, and Nagarjuna, and any other universities that you might be aware of. Okay, coming back to the body of the answer, how they were religious, not just religious or academic, it was much more than that. Our Prime Minister always talks, you know this, that the universities that we had at that point in time, it received students from all across the country and all across the world. So what happened to these students when they graduated, when they went back to other parts of the country or other parts of the world, they took the culture that they studied and they used it in their own place. It led to transmission of culture. It became, it is still an integral part of our soft power. Is it not? That is something that you can talk about. Other than that, you have, a, it gave a steady supply of administrators. Even now, this is quite relevant, right? When you go to a university, when you get a graduate degree, why do you, how do you use that degree? You can use it for various purposes. Some become administrators as well. One of the famous administrators 
of the ancient times was Chanakya. And Chanakya was a student of Takshasila University. And in these universities, what were the major subjects that they read? You know about this. They read about economics, they read about religion, theology, medicine and what not. From the ancient and the medieval times, one of the few medical medicine systems, which is one of the very important contribution of Indian culture, apart from yoga to the world, happens to be Ayurveda. Charaka, all right, he was a student of Takshasila University who has contributed to improving the Indian system of medicine. So wide knowledge across different domains we were trying to teach our students and we saw progress in that. That's one more point that you can talk about. Repository of knowledge and it acted as an archive. All of these universities, all right, they had very huge libraries. This is something which is quite evident in the ruins of the Nalanda University as well. And in these libraries, you found important information, not just related to our country, but important information across different countries, information across different subjects. Right? That's one more thing. Transmission of knowledge from one generation to another. Along with that, okay, what is one more point that you can talk about? Architectural marvels. The Nalanda ruins, right? By looking at this Nalanda ruins, we can make out they had big classrooms, they were properly planned, there were drinking water facilities, the libraries were huge. And remember, these are things which were done in the ancient times when the other civilization at that particular point in time were just learning to walk and we were running, right? Architectural marvels. Apart from that, economic growth of the cities. Wherever these universities were there, it led to the general improvement of their economy. It might be Nalanda, Takshasila, okay? It might be Nagarjuna, Vallabhi, all these cities, they saw a general improvement. It built a sense of tolerance as well, right? Because in these institutions, it was not just one religion which was taught. All religions were taught. All forms of uh, schools of philosophy were taught. It gave a better understanding for people. And here it was not the university that we have now where someone is talking and you're just listening, listening and listening. And that to pass it. Over there, knowledge was transmitted through discussions. And when you are discussing certain points, there is a larger probability that you will understand the mindset of another person. You're exploring your fullest potential. When you understand other cultures, when you have knowledge about other cultures, intolerance will be less. Right? That's one more thing that you can talk about. You can talk about beautiful works which were written by some of the passouts or alumnus of these ancient universities. Chanakya's Artha Shastra, which, has, which is still relevant today and which is still widely studied by many political philosophers, not just in India but across the world. Apart from being a religious and academic institution, they had a wider set of importance and significance for our country. Right? That is what we have established. How will you write your conclusion? There has been an interest and we have also revived universities such as Nalanda due to the contributions of India and some other countries in the region. There needs to be a renewed interest of that sort across all universities. They can be made as tourist areas. We can adopt the way they taught in those ancient and medieval uh, universities and apply to the present scheme of our education, which is characterized by rot learning. Right? Take what is good from them and implement it in our present scheme of education to make it better. That's one more thing. Okay? These are two conclusions that you can choose as per your convenience. Right? So this is about this question. I am very sure many people would not have had content, but what knowledge you have accumulated for your prelims exam purposes, if you can just structure them 
from an economic perspective, from a political perspective, from a governance perspective, how these universities were important, then that is much more relevant. Okay. Now, when we talk about universities, how did they generate money for them? These big, big empires, they used to give land which was near them. This is also something that you know. And these universities were responsible for the administration of those areas as well. So it was not just religious come academic establishments. It was also administrative centers. All right. So anyhow, let us now move on. This was all about art and culture. Let us now move on and discuss the society questions. Let us now look into the society questions which were part of your test. The first question is, what is the impact of gender division of labor on the development of society? Now, what is this gender division? Gender as a term is not something that is rooted in the biological terminology of sex. Sex is male or female. It's a biological phenomenon. The term gender, on the other hand, it is a societal construction. Here, gender means if you're born as a man, there are certain roles and responsibilities that you need to perform. If you're born as a woman, these are certain roles and responsibilities that you have to perform. If you don't perform these roles and responsibilities, then you're subjected to some sort of a punishment. You might be socially ostracized. All right. This gender division of labor, man is supposed to work. Man is supposed to earn. Woman, on the other hand, here what is the work or the labor where she is to be associated? It is primarily in the domain of within the four walls of a household. Take care of the family. That is the primary division of labor that we have given to women. In your introduction, you can talk about this gender division of labor in our country. Even though we are living in 21st century, this perception of gender division of labor still exists in our country. And how is this reflected? India has one of the lowest participation of women in the labor force, around 26.5%. This is very less. We have 50% of our population who are women and only 26.5% are in the labor force. One of the reasons for that happens to be the social perception of gender division of labor. You can use these two things, club it in the introduction. The social perception or the age-old traditions of looking at women and the responsibility within the four walls of the household is still prevalent in the present times. Kama, this is reflected in the low participation of women in the labor force in the bracket, you write 26.5%. This trend is antithetical to the development of women as well as the country, full stop. An introduction on similar lines. You can concise it even further as per your needs. Okay. In the body part, how will you talk about? When you divide gender, when you give care work exclusively to women, when they're doing care work, most of the times they're not being paid for it. And even if some women are doing care work where they are paid, it is very, very less. Is it not? So when they're doing care work, they spend most of their time on this work itself for which they're not getting paid. They're not getting any new skills. They will be financially dependent on their household, their male members. This reinforces that inequality that we have in our country. I remember reading a report which said that it would take India nearly 200 years to bridge that gender inequality that we have had. If we allow this gender division of labor to continue, that year, 200 years, will increase even further. Is it not? That is something that you can talk about. Gender division in patriarchy. The more and more we see a woman within the care work scenario, the more entitled some men would feel about showcasing their strength over women. 
subjugating woman. All right, this is something also that you can talk about because when they're doing care work, they're financially dependent on men, right? That patriarchy, that superior feeling of one's own gender increases drastically. Now, the social perception of gender division that women should be taking care of the household, it, it is so deep-rooted that you might have come across this in the rural areas or even in some urban areas. The moment a girl attains seventh grade, okay, she's taken off from school. The reasoning of the parents for taking off her from her school is what to use is knowledge to her. Because at the end of the day, she has to go back home, right? To someone home and work there. Why spend money on that? This is not right. It prevents the overall growth of women, right? That's one thing. Now here, in terms of labor, in terms of positions that are available to women in the present scenario, there was a study which was conducted. And this study was based on the advertisements which was issued in the newspapers. Most of the jobs which were available for women was in the sector of hospitality. Right? We tend to call them as pink collar jobs. In terms of other works being available to women, okay, in management position, which it was very less. Okay. There was also an observation in the report that many enterprises did not want to take women as well. The reason being when they get pregnant and when they're taking care of their family, their productivity will be less. Here, where is that gender division of labor fitting in? Taking care of the child is seen as an exclusive job of women. Yes, it is in terms of uh, feeding the baby and everything. But man can play an important role, can play an equal role in that as well. But we don't have that equal role perception as of now. Right? The gender division role is biased in the favor of men rather than women. Right? That is one more thing that you can talk about and how it creates barriers or shackles women. Management position. What example can I give? When you had the issue of providing permanent commission for women in the armed forces, there were arguments which were made which said that women are incapable of leading the soldiers who are men. This is a form of patriarchy, is it not? Because you are relegating women to a subjugated position, to a subservient position. That's not right. Right? So that is one more thing. Gender division and informal work. Here, I gave you initially the example of care work where it is done mostly on a free basis. And even if it is done, it is done on a very meager wages. Okay. And most of these care works are care workers who take care of elderly citizens. Right? They are all in the informal sector where wages are not paid in tune with other laborers who are men. Okay. All these things are there. Apart from that, gender division and transgender woes. Just by the act of them being transgender, many people don't want to hire them because of some sort of regressive mindset where they believe that hiring transgender will pollute the environment of the enterprise. Okay? They have these notions that transgenders lead an unhealthy lifestyle, but that is not entirely. That is not true at all. Right? We have provided rehabilitation measures. We have given skills to many transgender. But still in terms of them having access to jobs, it is very limited. The reason being the enterprises don't want to accept them. And they go back to those vulnerable jobs which, were, which they were doing earlier. It might be in prostitution. It might be begging and whatnot. All right? Moving on, gender division and freedom to work in certain fields. I spoke to you about the issue of permanent commission where arguments were made that women are not capable of leading men. And this is not just in terms of armed forces. There are many people still in India and across the world as well who believe that women are incapable of being political leaders. 
people vote not just based on religion and caste they vote based on the considerations of gender as well until and unless it is reserved constituency for women if in a general constituency where is no sort of reservation if a woman stands against men the probability of her winning is very less because people believe that a woman's role that a woman's work is primarily in the field of household rather than managing the country and this is the general perception right there are exceptions we you saw indira gandhi who was one of the boldest prime ministers that india has had you have nirmala sitaraman you had sushma swaraj all great leaders all right moving on how to overcome this gender division of labor perception because until and unless we overcome this we can't build an inclusive society the 50% of our population are women have to actively participate in the growth of the country achieving 5 trillion dollar and all is very easy it's not going to be that difficult but achieving that inclusive economy the gender equality is going to be a much bigger challenge here you have to focus you have to give a brief way forward since this is just a 10 marker question let it not be very expansive how will you say that you have to create awareness how will you create awareness by community participation on the lines of swachh bharat abhiyan or uh, beti bachao beti padao program okay providing or creating jobs okay ensuring educational opportunities are available to women across the country right once you take this comprehensive set of measures you will be able to overcome this gender division of labor but more focus on the social mindset change okay right that is the thing moving on let us discuss the next question this is about digital media do you think digital media and smartphones have affected indian society as negatively argue by giving suitable illustrations okay digital media and smartphones now when you look at the society questions in the past few years how they have asked question is they have given a major factor which brought about a change in the society and they have asked what kind of change it has brought has it been positive or has it been negative the major factor could be globalization okay it could be other factors such as pandemic here the fact is that they are focused on is digital media and smartphones okay the russia ukraine war they might frame a question on what impact it might have on indian society as well right there are probabilities of that because russia ukraine war is a major change that the world is witnessing at this point in time is it not right so how will you start your introduction you identify this major factors the growth of digital media and smartphones on the back of the rise in internet technology and literacy in india has brought about fundamental changes in the indian society since the last few decades just this much if you are able to represent in your introduction it is highly appreciated because you have captured the essence the core demand of the question in your introduction is it not moving on in the body of the answer how you will be talking about yes it has created certain negative effects give a subheading family interactions people want to interact through alexas people are interacting through zooms and uh, other video platforms that are available rather than having that face to face interactions right so once you have that that real emotional connectivity that we have with our family members they tend to reduce is it not there was a study which was conducted which showed that the kids who were in a home of alexa where alexa was used they had a much more association or positiveness towards alexa than their parents as well if they needed something they did not go and ask their parents but rather they went and asked alexa right that's one thing violence now when we talk about these smartphones the kids of our age are able to use it much more freely rather than what i grew up using it okay at, at that point in time we still had this nokia 1100 and all those sort of mobiles but kids of this age they know how to or book a cab okay order from zomato swiggy open youtube watch uh, videos on it download games from play store 
Some of these games are violent in nature. PUBG is violent in nature. Call of Duty is violent in nature. It tends to bring that mindset of violence. There is a proper scientific study on this. Games which are violent in nature, they tend to push the viewer in terms of violence. You can talk about that as well. It's not good, no? it's a negative feeling which has been created. Divisive feelings have increased. Because of this digital media and smartphone, okay, it has given a platform for people where they can act anonymously. When they are acting anonymously, they use this platform to spread false information, to create communal disharmony in certain cases. And this divisive feeling has increased to a larger extent because of this digital media and smartphones. We can talk about this. Apart from that, health and education. When I talk about kids, you remember there was a game which was available in the smartphones called as Blue Veil. This Blue Veil, it reinforced the suicidal tendencies which were there amongst the kids. So in terms of health, there is a lot of problem that is being created because of this digital media and smartphone. Smartphone addiction is a major problem in the present scenario. You all might have witnessed it in one form or the other. You might have fought it in one form or the other as well. Right? Education. Now remember, digital media and smartphone, these are not resources that everyone in our society have access to. Right? So if anyone is missing out on digital media and smartphones, their education will be harmed. And this is something that you witnessed during the times of the pandemic as well. Right? Many people had to leave the education because they did not have internet in their area or even if they had that, they could not afford it. They did not have the mobile resources. All these things are there. More and more inequality will be created and it is something which is happening in the present scenario as well. Digital media and smartphone affecting Indian society in various ways with examples we have showcased. Right? Moving on. No. Digital media and smartphones are not exactly creating only negative changes but rather it has led to some positive changes as well. In the domains of Right, health and education accessibility. You might be sitting in some other part of the country where there might not be any super specialty hospitals or doctors in it, but you can have telemedicine, teleeducation, which can be made available to you, provided that region has internet connectivity. Right, that's one thing. Connections. Here in the 21st century, migration within the country and outside the country are quite common. So how are people keeping up connections? They're keeping up connections through this uh, platform such as Zoom, Skype, which has helped them to stay in touch, which has helped them to provide with some sort of emotional connectivity, right? If these things were also not there, then it would have been difficult. Apart from that, e-governance apps, right? Digital media, smartphones have made the occurrence of e-governance much more easier. And using e-governance, we have been able to plug the leakages and corruptions that was there in the normal delivery of welfare services. Right? That's one thing your Jan Dan, your, uh, your Jam Trinity would not have been possible without of digital media and smartphones. Is it not? Apart from that, poverty tackling. How is digital media and smartphone related to poverty tackling? People use some of the digital media such as YouTube to educate themselves, right? To learn new skills, to find good jobs and ultimately to reduce the poverty that they might be facing. These are not the only positive or negative factors. There might be various other things. For example, in terms of cyberbullying that happens, that is a negative thing, right? In terms of child pornography, that is also a negative thing. You can talk about it. Right. In terms of digital media, if I have to talk about any positive things, it has given rise to OTT platforms such as Netflix, Amazon Prime Video, you all know the examples. And on these platforms, they make films on the alternative lifestyle, LGBTQ lifestyle. There is generally a great acceptance in the society in terms of alternative lifestyle. The awareness has increased. Okay. That's one thing.
right many examples are there you go for the highest priority ones and try to give at least five diverse ones in, for both the dimensions that is accepted right moving on you need to give a way forward on how to make digital media and smartphones negativeness what we have because of that reduced okay you can talk about how we need a digital security law to make sure that the privacy is maintained and not violated by the companies or the government you can talk about counselors that are there in the schools to talk about or to wean away children from the addiction of smartphones or digital media okay you can talk about mechanisms to deal with child pornography whatever issues you have raised all right you should make sure that you give a corresponding solution to it wherever possible conclusion Conclusion: What you can give is digital media and smartphones will be an integral part of a person, and access to it will determine the quality of life they will have. In this regard, the government should ensure accessibility as well as affordability. If you give this, that is more than enough. Okay, giving accessibility and affordability, and at the same time minimizing the harm that might be caused to them. by providing the steps which we discussed earlier concise it even what i told was on the longer side concise it be optimistic right that is what i was going for moving on the next question is globalization doesn't lead to loss of identity and culture it merely changes them for the better incorporating new and more diverse ingredients and processes critically examine globalization happens to be one of the most favorite topics of upsc almost every year there will be a question asked on globalization they will ask globalization and its impact on cultural identities it might be related to women uh, it might be related to sorry uh, uh, arts okay they might ask globalization and its impact on social actors here it might be women senior citizens children okay and they might ask how globalization is causing an identity problem or is it uh, not causing the question that they have given over here is corresponding to the last aspect right globalized uh, globalization doesn't lead to loss of identity and culture it merely changes them for the better incorporating new and more diverse ingredients and processes critically examine the directive over here is critically examine yes it is improving the process but at the same time it is leading to those processes which are indeed threatening our culture and changing the processes that we had for good right we have to justify that in the body of the answer here you can define globalization from a society perspective globalization is a multifaceted process which is not just related to economic angle the next question that we will discuss is on the topic of globalization all right and globalization is one of the most important and favorite topics of upsc how will they ask question they will ask question on how globalization has had an impact on certain social actors in our society it could be women it could be children it could be senior citizens they might ask how globalization has had an impact on the behavior of people okay it might be related to the religious behavior right that's one thing it might be related to globalization and behavior of people in the social sphere right and the other thing is how globalization has had an impact on the culture of our country has it still retained its diversity has it improved unity or created some conflicts the question that they have given over here it corresponds to the last one here the statement is rather positive in nature they are saying that globalization does not create to loss of identity or culture but rather it leads to an improvement of the existing processes but the directive that they have given us not elucidate or elaborate but rather critically examine so you have to give some points which justify the statement and you have to criticize the statement saying that no this is not the case because there are instances where it has led to the loss of identity and culture as well how will you start your introduction for this globalization right is not just economic terminology it has a society 
impact as well. Because in globalization, you emphasize on greater interactions. It might be brought about by migration, it might be brought about by the rise of media, technology, right? The inter transmission, the transmission of culture from various parts of the country also has an impact on how we think and act in our society. So you can give the society perspective in your introduction. The second thing is how it has not led to loss of any identity or culture, but rather it has improved the process. For that, you give some examples. Talk about globalization. What is this globalization? Globalization culture as well as local culture coexisting together. And where are they coexisting together? They are coexisting in the domain of heating habits. Because when you go to McDonald's, right, here you find Chicken Maharaja. Right? They are trying to cater to the India's need rather than blindly borrowing the cuisine or the menu that they have in other countries. Right? You can talk about that dressing st style. Yes, we all want to wear jeans and whatnot, western form of clothing. But in terms of when we have festivals, it is again back to that ethnic way. Right? Here we have music, we have already spoken about it, fusion music, where you have the western hip-hop music coexisting with the classical music in our country, which is reflected in various cinemas as well, right? So here you have talked about localization, where there is no loss of identity or culture. It has also led to the improvement in our process. In what, what is the example that I can give over here? It has created widened opportunities for women. In a globalized society, we realize that women's potential, all right, is very important for leading a higher standard of living. Once we realize this, all right, is it not an improvement of the process that we have had? At a global level, you are coming across many entrepreneurs who are from India and particularly from the female gender as well, right? Improvement in our processes. Globalization has had an impact in terms of minimizing corruption. How so? Because before 1991, we had a system called as License Raj, which gave huge amount of power to government servants, which they used it for corruption. And whenever there is corruption, at the end of the day, it is the poor people or the poverty which will rise. But when you have globalization, when you are part of global institutions such as WTO, you have to reduce or eliminate this license Raj as much as possible. You have to bring in transparency. And when you do that, corruption is combated to a certain extent. This will help us in tackling poverty. Right? This is how you need to justify there has been an improvement in our process. In which process? Political process, social process, as well as economic processes. What examples have I given in social sphere? I have spoken about LGBTQ awareness. Because when you look at the movements that are happening in the world, there has been a movement for acceptance of alternative lifestyle. We are being introduced to these ideologies and movements. You all have heard of a lady called as a girl called as Greta Thunberg. She is related to bringing awareness in the domain of climate change. You have come across hashtag MeToo movement, which raised issues faced by women related to their safety in workplace institutions. All of them, right? They are being addressed because of the levels of globalization we have reached. It is helping the process that we have in our country. However, right, now you have to criticize the same statement saying that, however, it can lead to loss of identity and culture too. Example, our fascination towards English. It's not just fascination towards English. It's fascination towards what we perceive as westernized lifestyle. And when you're leading a westernized lifestyle, there is all the probability that you might face a sense of isolation, anxiety, depression. You might give emphasis to that class mentality. 
when you have all these things it does not improve your standard of living by any larger degree yes poverty has reduced in our country since 1991 but at the same time inequality has risen to a very large extent as well is it not so all of these things cumulatively are affecting our culture are affecting our processes right that is something that you can talk about how there are decline in takers for classical arts people want to learn hip hop a lot more now because when you take up classical music or classical dance there is a process you have to spend years together to get a certificate but when you uh, take up hip hop or anything like that it is not the same rigid process that we have right that something unhealthy lifestyle i have already spoken about it and has it improved our process not a lot because now we are answerable to wto to reduce our food subsidy right we are more prone to issues such as npa crisis which was at the core of 2008 9 crisis we are prone to issues such as pandemic which we all witness and which we are witnessing even in the present times so the processes have not actually improved as they have given in the statement okay what should be the way forward to minimize negative impacts obviously how to minimize this negative impacts to focus on each of these negative things how to emphasize on identity and culture our education system needs to put more focus we need to introduce our kids into classical arts i'm not saying push them into classical arts but introduce to them make sure that the process that we have is flexible enough okay fascination towards english is increasing because we have not increased opportunities for our students in regional languages and this is something that we are trying to correct through our national education policy 2020 so you when you are giving a way forward you are also highlighting some of the steps taken by the government this is what is required and in the conclusion you can see the globalization which is being implemented now is implemented from a top down approach from the prism of developed countries we need to ensure it's a bottom up approach where the emphasis is given on welfare right once we base globalization on this welfare concept whatever negative things that we have highlighted in the answer will be tackled automatically all right let us now move on and discuss the next question the next question which we will discuss is based on population issues in our country what is this question discuss the effectiveness of population control measures in india will decreased population lead to a better standard of living critically analyze now when we talk about the introduction for this question highlight the importance of population until and unless we control population we will not be able to manage the resources that we have and distribute them in a just manner to our population if we don't do this in a just manner there is all the probability that social frustration and pressures might increase and this might lead to communal tendencies all right another alternative introduction is until and unless we control our population meeting some of the goals of sustainable development will be difficult right any of the method you can go ahead with okay just don't go with that data approach where you talk that india has 17% of global population and 4% everyone does that if you want to go for this that is also fine no issues right what is it that we need to talk about in the body of your answer first briefly mention about some of the measures that we have taken we have set up various committees all right these committees have spoken about family planning measures and in terms of this we have gone with the sterilization efforts as well we have tried to improve the contraceptive usage amongst people we have tried to create awareness among people all right and we have come out with programs such as hum do hamare do program to create awareness about the importance of having just two children as per national population policy 2000 we had given ourselves the targets of two total fertility rate of 2.1 we have established primary health care uh, centers we have anganwadi workers asha workers all involved right in a way to control population in our country so briefly mention don't explain or anything just mention about them what are the achievements that we have done population 
stabilization has happened right how can i establish that in from 1990 to 2000 the population growth was around 20 percent in the preceding decade sorry in the preceding decade this had come down to 17 percent this is good right here the contraceptive usage was 57 it increased to around 67 percent in the preceding decade right that's one more point that you can talk about okay in terms of having acts such as prevention of child marriage act right we are seeing that people are getting married at a later age in recent years that's also a good thing because when people are getting married at a later age the number of children or the size of the family might be less all right uh, when i talk about this total fertility rate the target that we have of 2.1 many of the states in our country have already achieved it in fact some of the states have less total fertility rate than the national average as well these are just some of the basic achievements that we have established despite these achievements when you look at the population control in our country it's not exactly going the way we want it's not ideal it's not completely effective what are the issues in this uneven nature of performance south indian states have performed relatively better compared to north indian states particularly states such as up bihar you can talk about that okay not very holistic as uh, the population control measures that we have it focuses on family planning to a larger degree okay but family planning depends to a larger degree on the poverty on the economic resources right here we do have programs for tackling poverty but we need to have a program which merges these two concepts or brings about a coordination with the programs that we have got and there are so much of leakages and corruptions in the systems that we have had that tackling poverty and population is becoming more and more difficult right and ours is a country where social security is still not penetrated to the degree that we want still people think social security in terms of having kids this perception is something that we need to reduce the more number of kids they have the greater the social security this is the social perception people have particularly in rural areas when you provide social security to, uh, to them through insurance right qualitatively good jobs then uh, this will reduce automatically right apart from that awareness is still lacking because see even if you have given 67 percent contraceptive coverage there's still 33 percent who are still remaining this is a very large number in the context of india is it not these are the issues that we need to address and here they've asked will decrease population lead to a better standard of living absolutely not right it might improve to a certain degree but completely 100% it might not there might be other factors which might determine the standard of living it might be poverty it might be access to resources such as digital infrastructure it might be access to jobs social security and what not population is just one aspect yes when you decrease your population rate your resource accessibility increases your per capita gdp increases but this in itself will not lead to a better standard of living in a holistic manner providing clean environment okay reducing the vulnerability of the population to disasters which is which are happening in our country all these are cumulatively important to ensure a better standard of living is it not that's something that you need to address in the way forward we need a holistic process i've already spoken about it right conclusion population control in india should be re renewed and revitalized by bringing appropriate changes in the current existing mechanism so as to achieve a sustainable and inclusive growth if you give a conclusion an optimistic conclusion okay based on reality that is more than enough let us now move on and discuss the next question the next question is in a multi-class society, communalism and casteism grow on existing rifts and affect various status of Indian society. Illustrate. Illustrate is nothing but you please give examples to justify the statement. That's it. Right? How will you start your introduction? Highlight how social markers like religion and caste and the uneven growth observed in them can lead to heightened sense of one's own religion and caste. 
you might have all read about Syed Ahmed Khan who was behind the Aligarh movement. Okay, he advised the Muslims not to participate in the national freedom struggle because he felt that the Muslims were relatively backward in terms of economic resources or having access to government jobs compared to their Hindu compatriots. He wanted them to focus on improving their standard of living and then focusing on the national freedom struggle. And these differences in terms of growth, in terms of health, education is still persistent even in the present scenario. Right? The various inequalities that we have, be it in terms of religion, be it in terms of caste, the rifts that we have, it affects the various strata of Indian society. Well, you need to illustrate it by giving example. The next question that we will discuss is, in a multi-class society, communalism and casteism grow on the existing rifts and affects various strata of Indian society. Illustrate. When they are asking you to illustrate, you just have to give them examples. Okay. How the existing rifts in our religion, in our caste is affecting various strata of Indian society. How will you start your introduction? You can talk about how communalism and casteism are two social markers or hierarchies that we have in our country and the religious development or the caste development is not equal. This is given to resentment which affects Indian uh, the, so other communities in different ways. You can... Uh, draw an introduction on similar lines, but it has to be very concise in nature. Since I'm explaining here, I tend to go to verbose, right? Anyways, coming back, how will you write the body of the answer? What are the existing rifts that we've got? Relatively less growth of some communities. You might have remember about Syed Ahmed Khan who said, who advised the Muslims not to participate in the national freedom struggle because when compared to the Hindus, their economic capability was not as developed as Hindus during the national freedom struggle, right? So when people feel that they're relatively less economically capable, right, they tend to develop a deep sense of fear, a deep sense of attachment towards one, their own religion, because that is where they feel safe, right? This relatively less growth is not something that we need to allow continue, we need to fight it. And how is this relatively less growth of some communities manifesting itself? It can be related to the reservation movements that we are seeing. Right? Apart from that uneven power distribution in government sectors. People are asking for OBC reservations. People are asking to be included in the SC, ST. And it's not just people who are from the lower sections of the society who don't have economic capability, but also people from the higher, supposedly higher caste, because in recent years, their, their participation in the government sector has decreased at the cost of the rise in other caste. And this is something that is not being accepted by them. Right? And this existing rift is based on the whole system of caste, which is based on hierarchy of high and low. Existing rifts affecting various strata of Indian society. Trust deficit that exists between various religions. Okay, When we have different religions, when we have different caste, and still when people follow this concept of superiority and inferiority, obviously there will be trust deficit. Okay, People will not trust a person from another caste or another religion because they have been socialized in such way as not to trust them. That's wrong. Okay. Existing rifts causing problems for us. If we allow to continue this to happen, unity will be affected. Right? Along with that, you have politicization of these rifts by the politicians. You see all the hate speeches which are happening. They're trying to divide people just solely so that they can come to power. Okay. Then you have honor killings as well happening in our country based on again existing rifts, right? Honor killings happen because apparently the people who commit these murders, they somehow believe that the honor of their family will be restored once they kill their kids who have committed, who have involved themselves in inter-caste or inter-faith marriages. 
this is also because how we view other religions as being lesser than uh, what your religion is right existing groups affecting various strata of indian society the youth right religiously segregated lives when we talk about our country there was this one research which was conducted by pew research organization which said that indians value religious tolerance but lead a religiously segregated lives how many of us have come across people who do not want people from other communities or caste as their neighbors you have come across rented houses in wherever whichever cities you stay they they would have put up a board saying that only for vegetarians why they would have done that they would have exclusively done that because in indian society scenario dietary habits are somewhat related to the caste position as well right so these are some of the ways on how the notions that my religion or my caste is better than yours the existing divisions that are there is causing problem for various strata of india's society apart from that okay these rifts challenges uh, poses challenges to establish an inclusive society we have spoken about that an elaborate way forward to address these issues we have to make sure that the growth becomes as equitable as possible we have to ensure that the politicization of religion or hate speeches is addressed by making a proper anti hate speech law right we have to ensure greater intermingliness of people okay we have to ensure that the culture of people the various cultures we have we have got an awareness about them this can be done by bringing in educational changes right that's one thing apart from that what can we talk about we can talk about how we need to emphasize a secular way of thinking not just at the political level but at the ground level right that is both of the things are quite important until and unless we develop that secular frame of thinking okay this existing rifts will continue to happen and we will suffer even more right conclusion what conclusion could be given communalism and casteism right are antithetical to the development of our country okay it is quite important to tackle them in the light of ensuring an inclusive country and also to increase the general happiness of the people in the society right because when we talk about gross national happiness india performs quite poorly and there are multiple reasons for that as long as we have this divisive mindset people can't be happy in a true manner so you can talk about that nothing wrong with it okay so this is about your art and culture as well as society questions which were part of your gs1 step up series i hope this was useful and for your upcoming examination i wish you the very best take care thank you all the best again